to take out your cell phones, uh, si- put them on silence. That's the first step. Uh, and then let us know that you're here this morning using our uh, check-in platform through text message. Uh, the box on the left is for folks who've never used it before. If you follow the prompts all the way through, just give us some contact information. Uh, this information stays in-house. Uh, it, we love to reach out to people who are new with us just to welcome them uh, with either a phone call or an email or a handwritten note just to say thank you for coming. If you're a regular member or a participant in the life of the church, uh, we encourage you to uh, check in with the box, information uh, in the box on the right. Immediately following worship, a couple things you need to know. There's a Stephen minister, as there is each and every week, uh, in our chapel down this hallway and to the left, who is there to meet anyone, members and friends alike, uh, in the ministry of prayer. So if you have something on your heart that you'd like prayer for, we encourage you to take advantage of that ministry. Uh, here today, um, I will be launching our uh, First in Focus series uh, called Lead Like Jesus. It's a series on servant leadership. Our first in focus is a six-week um, uh, uh, educational uh, and spiritual formation opportunity. It begins with a lecture uh, and then has four weeks in the various Sunday school classes offered through the life of the church uh, that focus on discrete content and curriculum related to that theme. And then we close the series with another lecture here in Fifefield Hall. So immediately following um, immediately following worship, I will be here uh, facilitating a conversation and presenting on this new First in Focus series as part of our long-range strategic plan, uh, encouraging all of us to live into our call to be servant leaders. And so that is the theme, Lead Like Jesus. You'll hear more about that throughout the morning uh, in the sermon as well. A couple of pastoral notes that I want you to be aware of. Our prayers are with Bland, Monique, and Nikki Byrne on the death of Monique's father, Ronald Wise of Brenham, Texas, who died October 7th. We also offer our condolences to John and Duggan Lansing. Duggan is currently serving on our session to their family on the death of Duggan's father, Roy Childers, who died on October 11th. Also, we want to let the congregation know uh, this date ebbed and flowed, flowed over the last couple of weeks, but Ann Black, the spouse of Reverend Charles Black, whose service we just had a, a few uh, weeks ago, Ann's service, his spouse, her memorial service is November the 3rd. Uh, the family is able to come back together on that day, November the 3rd, 11 a.m. in the sanctuary. Uh, you're all invited to give a witness and testimony to the resurrection and the faithfulness for Anne's uh, life. Uh, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. The prophet Isaiah uh, reminds us of our call to respond to God, when God asks us to go, when God calls us to be sent in and for the world, Isaiah models for us the appropriate response. Here I am, Lord, send me. We are now sent into the presence of God, into this time of worship, giving thanks that God is here. If you're able, I'd invite you to stand as we sing our opening song, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Friends, let us worship our God.
we enter into confession, let us move from those shallow places in our lives to the depths of God's grace and God's forgiveness. Let's pray together. Gracious God, our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, and too deep to undo. Forgive what our lips tremble to name, what our hearts can no longer bear, and what has become for us consuming fire of judgment. Set us free from a past that we cannot change. Open to us a future in which we can be changed. And grant us grace to grow more and more in your likeness and image. Through Jesus Christ, the light of the world, amen. Now take time for our silent prayer of confession. Hear the good news. Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone. A new life has begun. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Hallelujah. Amen. worship bags in the back there and you can do some fun things. Also, even the bulletin is for you. There's some questions in there, um, multiple choice, and if you get them right, you can show them to Pastor Tony on the way out. And especially this next part of the service is really, really for you because I'm about to invite some of your friends up here for the special sacrament called baptism. So we're going to invite up the Blair family. You may know Charlie Harris. You probably don't know Watson because he's just a tiny baby. And you may know Harris and Charlie's mom and dad, Jeremy and Melissa. And so we're getting ready for this part in the service where talking and speaking and reading is through. And we go to a place, a very special place, that the Holy Spirit takes us. And we know that God loves us so much through the water and the prayers for baptism. On behalf of the session, I present Charles, Charlie David Blair, Harris Mel Blair, and Watson Joel Blair to receive the sacrament of baptism. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, Jesus said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples in my name baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you to the end of the age. And so, obeying the word of the Lord, we listen for what is happening in baptism. In baptism, God claims us and seals us to show that we belong to God. God frees us from sin and death, uniting us with Jesus Christ in his death and resurrection. By water and the Holy Spirit, we are made members of the church, one body of Christ, and joined to Christ's ministry of love, peace, and justice. Let us remember with joy our own baptisms as we celebrate this sacrament. 
Jeremy and Melissa. In presenting your children for baptism, you announce your own faith in Jesus Christ and that you desire your children to know God and to love God and to serve God. So please show that purpose by answering these questions. Trusting in the gracious mercy of God, do you turn from sin and evil in the world and reaffirm your faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? If so, answer, I do. Do you promise to participate actively with your children in the life of this congregation and to bring up your children in the ways of the Lord, praying with and for Charlie, Harris, and Watson? If so, answer, I do. These children will be received into Christ's church, and this congregation has a role in their nurture. To that end, do you promise with God's help to support their parents by providing opportunities for service, worship, and study? And do do you promise to love these children and to assist them in becoming faithful followers of Jesus Christ? If so, please respond by saying, we do. We, we do. do. Boys, do you want to put your hand in the water? Do you want to feel the water? Charlie, do you want to feel the water, Pam? Do you want to put your hand in there now? You can feel it. Do you want to see it? Put your hand in. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this water. It just comes from Atlanta Public Works, something so ordinary and common, but so essential for the nourishment of, your, of our lives. We pray that you set this water apart from its common and ordinary purposes, so it may be for Charlie and Harris and Watson, and for all of us who remember our baptism, the sign and seal of invisible grace the sign and seal that we are all your children. For this gift, we say thank you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Melissa and Jeremy, we'll start with Charlie. And tell me the Christian name of this child. Charles David Blair. Charles David. I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. May the blessings of God Almighty descend upon you and dwell in your heart forever. Amen. Go back to your mom. Okay. And for Harris, what, what is the Christian name of this child? Harris Noel Blair. Harris Noel. Harris is a little bit older, so we're going to ask him questions. And Harris, by coming here today, you're showing that you love Jesus, so now we're going to ask you to use your words showing that you love Jesus. Do you want to be baptized? Say, I do. Okay. Do you want to turn from the bad ways of the world and turn to Jesus and love and grow and live in Jesus? If so, say, I do. Okay. And adults use this language that we say we love and trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. It's kind of like a leader and a protector. If you trust in Jesus that way, say, I do. Great. Okay. Here is Noel. I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. May the blessings of God Almighty descend upon you and dwell in your heart forever. Amen. And what is the Christian name of this child? This is Watson Joel Blair. I won't wake him up to ask him any questions. <laughs> Watson, Joel, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And may God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit live inside of you this day and every day of your life. Amen. Jamie, what do, we, what do you say we take a little walk right. with the Blair boys? Oh, wow. Friends, the very best gifts in life come to us wrapped up in flesh. We know that full well in the gifts that God chooses to give to each one of us, in family and friends, in communities of faith like this one. We're also ever mindful of this gift in what God chose to do in and as the person of Jesus Christ, coming as a baby for you and for me and for the world. 
This is the good news of the gospel. But by his coming, we are all claimed as children of God. May we live such a life. And let us pray. Lord, we thank you for all the gifts that you give us, for the gifts of family and friends, communities of faith, and especially this day for the gift of the Blair family and these boys. Use us to bear witness to your good news in, and in their lives and for their lives so that we may be found faithful to the covenant promises that they stand on this day. In Christ's name we pray and all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. In the life of this uh, congregation, we've had now over 40 baptisms in uh, 2018. It's just a sign of what God's doing in and through this church. Uh, and as Jamie welcomed the children earlier, let me reiterate how glad we are that our children are with us in worship, that they're not separated or, or put out somewhere else, that we represent the whole body of Christ and we need everybody, including our children, so that we may be found faithful. Our text set before us today as we begin this new uh, sermon series and our first in focus series, uh, there, there are two texts, one from Paul's letter to the church in Philippi and then uh, the gospel of John. Let me read each of these in turn. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but he emptied himself taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord." To the glory of God the Father. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And from the Gospel of John, the 13th chapter, something that we hear during Holy Week. We're hearing it a little out of place in this sermon series during this fall season. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus answered, you do not know now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, you will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Friends, this too is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you join me in prayer? Lord, break open uh, your word afresh to us this day so that we would be different people than those who came into this sacred space uh, this morning, even to be more like your son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Well, I want to launch into this series uh, with a very personal story, a very personal experience that I had uh, just this week that I think uh, reflects and illustrates both the timeliness and the urgency of our Lead Like Jesus sermon series and First in Focus series. I'm part of a group called the Community of Pastors, which is made up of men and women. There's 25 of us in total, and we all serve as heads of staff of medium to large Presbyterian congregations throughout the country. 
And every six months, we get together for three nights, three days, and we're hosted by one of the pastors in their context and hosted by the church that they serve. And and our time together is incredibly meaningful for those of us in this cohort. Uh, We spend some time uh, sharing ideas, best practices. We, We engage in professional development. We also take advantage of the locations in which we're in. We do some excursions. We do some touring together. We do some fun things together. We share in festive meals and fellowship time together. We also worship together each and every day as part of the rhythm of our meeting. One of the other things that we do each and every time we get together is we have a check-in time. And it always happens on Monday morning. We fly in Sunday night. It happens on Monday morning. It's, it's one of the first things that we do as part of our business and our, and our time together because it's so important for us to have a space to be able to share what's happening, to be able to, to, to share sort of the highs and lows of ministry. It gives us an opportunity to to talk about the, 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 the faithfulness and the ministry that we see that's bringing us joy, but it also gives us a very safe space to share those places of hardship and trial and challenge. Uh, this year, or this uh, rather time coming together, uh, was very different than uh, previous times that I have experienced in my six plus years of being part of this cohort. A couple of our colleagues through Tears were sharing about their untenable situations where a small number of church members have made it their business to get rid of them. They have poisoned sort of the leadership well and have made it impossible and untenable for them to continue on in those contexts. Other colleagues reflected about how difficult it is to pastor in these particular times to pastor in this season of dissonance and, and fragmentation and the intensity of our, of our politics and our social living, how hard it is to pastor in these days. And some of our, our colleagues uh, reflected on how challenging it is to carry hope, to bring good news to a people who are so often afflicted, so filled with pain or heartache, misdirection, misgivings, people who are filled with anger in these times. How do we show up faithfully to bring that pastoral and prophetic word that needs to be spoken? As I said, this time and this gathering was very different than other experiences I have had. There were more tears shed. There was more anger expressed. There was more desperation in body than I had ever experienced in this group before. It was an intense morning. Well, the next morning, uh, this following morning after all our check-ins, feeling emotionally and and sort of spiritually spent, but at least supported by our colleagues, we toured the Naval Academy. We were in Annapolis, Maryland, and of course, if you're in Annapolis, one of your excursions has to be seeing uh, this great institution in our national life. We had a wonderful uh, tour of uh, the chapel. Here it's pictured from the outside. And and we were able to worship up in the chancel area uh, with the organists of the Navy Chapel. It's one of the finest organs uh, in the nation. It's this beautiful combination of theater and church organ. While we were doing this hymn sing, I immediately texted Jens. And I said, Jens, you got to play this thing. And he said, I'm on the list. So it was a rejuvenating time in this sacred space. We sang together. We worshiped together. I don't know about you, but when I am feeling in, like I'm in a dark space, or I'm feeling disconnected, or led astray, or confused, or anxious, worship is one of those anchoring spots for me. Coming together to be able to worship God with one another, to commune with God, it brought us that sort of peace and that healing our group needed in the moment as we sang hymn after hymn after hymn. And it was during that hymn sing that I had a profound spiritual experience. From my vantage point, I saw this stained glass window. Uh, It depicts a, a fresh graduate of the academy who is now an officer upon his graduation 
with his hat in one hand, and in the other hand, he has his orders, his call of duty. Now, one of the reasons why this was so meaningful to me and something that I, I want you to know is that my father was in the Navy. He wasn't a student or a graduate of the Naval Academy, but he enlisted when he was 17 years old. He was looking for a purpose in life, and he was really looking to escape the tyranny of poverty that he knew in the Kensington section of Philadelphia. He also sought to escape the tyranny of an abusive father, an alcoholic father. He served in the, in the Navy during the Cuban Missile Crisis. He was part of the blockade, serving on the USS Enterprise. I keep a 1961 black and white photo of him in his dress uniform. Sorry about that. Quick on the trigger. In his dress uniform by my bedside. And so I see it often as I go to sleep. This picture was taken 30 years before he died of mesothelioma caused by asbestos. He was 46. My mother was 40. I was 16. My brother was 13. And as I looked at, at that stained glass window, in all of its dignity, in, in, in its presence of, of what it means to serve, and what it means to have orders, and what it means to lead, I thought about my dad. And I started to pray a very specific prayer in the silence of my own heart. I started to pray, Lord, who will lead us in this time of dissonance? Who will lead us in this time of vitriol? Who will lead us in this day when we so desperately long for unity we so desperately long for peace. We so desperately long for the divine life to be made known to us. Who is going to lead us? And as I'm praying this prayer, all of a sudden, someone from our group shouts out to the organist, we can't have a hymn sing unless we sing Eternal Father Strong to Save. Which, for those of you church folk who know the hymns of the church, know that that is the Navy hymn. And as we started to sing it, I wept. I just wept. For I felt something that I hadn't felt in a long time. I felt this acute need, this deep desire to hear my father's voice. To hear him speak to me to give me direction, to show me the way I need to go. I longed for his leadership to be known once again in my life. And then all of a sudden, I noticed something different, which isn't well depicted in this particular rendering of the stained glass window, but it is on this one, if I can get to it. You see in the upper right-hand corner, I hadn't noticed it, but there is Jesus riding on the clouds with his arm extended, almost saying that I have a greater assignment for you. I have a commission for you that transcends all earthly commissions. I am sending you. And in that instant, I realized that I just might be the leader I've been praying for. I realized that I just might be the leader that I am longing for by the grace and mercy of God. And then in that moment, I thought about you. And I don't mean to be cheesy or or Pollyannish, but I thought about you. I thought about our congregation. I, I thought about our pastors and our staff. I, I thought about who we are and who we're, what we're trying to be as a, 
as a church. And I thought about all the pain and the anxiety and the dissonance and the struggle that so many of us carry in these times. And I was convinced in that moment of transcendence, that moment of prayer, I was convinced that we are the leaders we've been praying for. Not somebody else, not somebody out there somewhere, not somebody we're going to vote for in November, not the, just the pastors in this church, but all of us, all of us are the leaders we've been longing for. It's part of the scandal of the gospel that Jesus commissions all of us to lead and to lead like him. That is our call. It's a call and a leadership that's modeled after the way of Jesus. It's not modeled after what is put in front of us as effective leadership. Sometimes it does more to divide and break down. Sometimes it seeks its own sort of gratification. It seeks to promote its own security, its own institutionalism its own safety, its own privileges. That's not what we're talking about when we talk about leading like Jesus. What we're talking about here is leading in such a way that we become a servant the way Christ served us. What you need to know about the genesis of this sermon series is that it didn't just appear out of thin air, that it is a product, it is the fruit of our long-range strategic plan. If you've been here for the last couple of years, you know that that plan is bringing so much fruit into this world, so much fruit into this church. So many things are happening by God's grace and by God's providence because we respond faithfully to what it means to be the church, I think, in this time. And one of those responses is equipping all members and all friends of this church to be servant leaders, to lead like Jesus and so in addition to this sermon series, we've also, as I said earlier, created this curriculum that I encourage each and every one of you to participate in as you are able across these various Sunday school classes and in these lectures both today and at the end of the series. Opportunities to really think critically about what it means to lead like Jesus. That we're not just saying that in some feel-good kind of way, but that there are qualities and characteristics and competencies that make up this type of leadership, that make up this type of life. The other thing we need to know is that we're not waiting for anybody on this one. We're not waiting for somebody else to lead us. We are responding because we believe we are the leaders we've been praying for, for this church, our city, our nation, and the world. I want to say something briefly just about servant leadership. Uh, there's a man by the name of Robert Greenleaf whose name is probably familiar to many of you. He wrote a book in the 1970s which essentially coined this phrase, servant leader. His essay was called servant, The Servant as Leader. After a successful career with AT&T, he spent the second half of his life as an author and a speaker uh, and, and as a consultant promoting these competencies of servant leadership. And he developed a series of qualities and characteristics that he said are, is what makes up a servant leader. Greenleaf was convinced that the kind of leadership the world longs for, whether it's in the for-profit sector, the non-profit sector, whether it's in education, whether it's in government, whether it's in the church or any institution, the, the type of leadership people want to follow is the servant leader. We may get enamored with the glitz and the glamour of someone really powerful, especially if they're on our side. But what the world really needs, what the world really needs is, a, is servant leadership. Leaders, And he believed that there were competencies. He believed that people could learn these skills and these qualities and characteristics. And here's what's so interesting for Christians ever since Greenleaf started writing in this way. Christians, theologians and pastors and lay people alike, they would go to Greenleaf's material. They'd start reading his books and they'd say, I've heard this before. I've seen these competencies before. They are not unfamiliar to me. And what they have expressed over these years, over these 40 plus years, is that no other human being embodied this type of leadership more faithfully, more fully than Jesus himself. 
And that's what the Apostle Paul says, right, in the, in the letter to the Philippians. That's what he's talking about, to have the same mind as Christ Jesus, to think like Jesus. I don't think there is anything more appropriate, more precise, talking about the character and the, the nature of Jesus than this text from Philippians. It's actually a, a hymn. Many scholars believe that it was one of the first hymns that was ever sung in worship. And embedded in this first line is to have the same mind as Christ, to think like Christ, to act like Christ, to live like Christ. Look, here's the deal. If we want to call ourselves Christian, it is not about ascribing to some theological order. It is not about uh, necessarily the pious habits. Those are all fruits of this critical decision that you and I make each and every day. To be Christian means to be like Jesus. That's what it means. And Lord knows we need Christians who live that way. Not because of something, some political or theological ideology, but a way of being human in the world. And that's the type of leadership I think this world needs and this world is aching for. I know it's what I ache for. To live like Jesus, to act like him, to think of ourselves in the same way. How did he think of himself? This text from John 13 this beautiful picture of what he thought of himself, right? Where he gets down and he washes the disciples' feet. Now, if we are going to have, and I'll close with this, if we're going to have a conversation, if we're going to have a conversation about leadership in the way of Jesus, or leadership in any way, but especially with leadership in the way of Jesus, we have to talk about power. We have to talk about it. John 13, 3, staying with this text, it says, knowing that the Father had given all things into Jesus' hands. Did you hear that text when I read it, that part of the text, rather, that line? We kind of quickly go by it. What is the writer saying? What is John saying? He's saying that Jesus had everything, everything he could possibly want or need. He was the essence of power. And what does he do with his power? When you talk about leadership, you have to talk about power. And what does he do with his power? He empties himself. He humbles himself. He empties himself of his own will so that the will of God can be filled in his life. Jesus takes his privilege of the divine life. He takes that privilege and he uses it to get down on his hands and knees and serve his friends. That's what he does. And that is authentic leadership. It demonstrates his love for us, his love for them, his love for the world. Now, remember this. You have power, friends. You have power. We're not naive to know that the world is messed up. I'd use other words if I wasn't preaching. But it is messed up. And we should be unsatisfied with the truth, unsatisfied with the truth that there is a miss, a gap with power and privilege. But all of us, we can claim, because we're human beings created in the image of God, all of us at some level have privilege and power. All of us do. It varies, but all of us do. And the question is, how are we going to leverage that power? Because that is the first question of a servant leader. How am I going to leverage these gifts and what God has put me in charge of to love and bless the world? We know what Jesus did. He washed the disciples' feet. He, he made the blind see, he helped the lame walk, he comforted the afflicted, he afflicted the comfortable, he accepted the unaccepted, and he died for us all. Church, we have power in varying degrees. What will we do with it? That's the question. What will we do with it? Will we use it for our own advancement, for our own security, for our own people group, for the people who are on our side? Will we use it that way to, 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 to build bigger gaps in human relationships? Or will we become the leaders we so desperately long for? Will we become people who empower others to find their voice and their place in the story of God? Will we think the way Christ thought about himself? Because that's what it means to be a Christian. To be like him by his grace. To live like him. To pray like him. To love like him. Will we receive that commission? I want you to think about that picture. I want you to think about Jesus extending his arms to you and saying, I'm sending you to lead the way I've led, to become the 
leaders we've been praying for. I mentioned the words of the prophet Isaiah at the beginning. Isaiah 6, where God is asking the people, who's going to go for us? Who's going to be sent for us? So often we look to the outside for that answer. So often we look to somebody else. Someone else is going to have to lead us. Somebody else is going to have to do this. Somebody else is going to have to pick up a towel and pick up a cross. But today, church, may we respond the way the prophet Isaiah did. When the Lord asks, who will we send? May we say, Lord, send me so that we all may lead like Jesus for the sake of the gospel and for the sake of the world. Let us pray. Lord, we give you thanks for the gifts of your grace and the love that you shower upon us, for the ways in which you've modeled true leadership, authentic servant leadership. May we claim your commission upon us so that we may lead like Jesus in every sphere of our lives and be found faithful to his call upon us. We pray this in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us now sing the words of the prophet Isaiah. I, the Lord of sea and sky, if you're able, I'd invite you to stand. This was a pretty amazing week for me. Many seasons and many weeks and many days, uh, it's hard for me to hear the voice of God. 
just a confession there. Maybe it's hard for you too. It's hard sometimes to, to really hear the clarity of God speaking to us. And this week I had one of those moments as I shared at the beginning of the sermon. Uh, a, a clear call to be the leader and for us to be the leaders that God is calling us to be. That the world longs for, that I long for. I had another moment this week. It's very brief and I'll, I'll, I'll let you go with this. Uh, I was in the car picking up our younger son, Luke, from school. I had done the liturgy the week before. I had just gotten back from this conference, so feeling all of that spiritual emotion and energy of the week. And he gets in the car. He's not one who reads the bulletin ahead of time. And he starts singing out of nowhere the refrain, here I am, Lord. And I needed to hear her because I was stuck in Atlanta traffic. The call to lead like Jesus exists in the world. That's where it is so very necessary and where we're called to say, here I am, send me. Would you do that? And may the peace of God, which goes beyond all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ. May his peace live inside of you this day and every day of your life. Amen? Amen. And go or stay in peace.